Hey, welcome, welcome back. It's Sarah from Roadworthy. It's time for a weekly wrap up. Um, sorry, I've got a stack of books here that I'm poking into my butt. Fantastic reading week. Um, obviously, you can see I'm back from Florida. Um, yeah, what else? I, you know, this trip back from Florida, oh God, and the time change, I don't know, somehow the three hour time change was really rough. Um, and I was, I've been pushing myself to make it to like 8.30 <laughs> before going to bed and I'm up at like five o'clock. Anyway, whatever. Um, and, and of course, you know, I, I hate getting back from a trip like that and then like all the stuff you have to do, you know, in your home when you return from vacation, right? Like the fridge is empty, the laundry, the cleaning, blah, blah, blah. So I feel like it's like, you know, bam, you know, vacation's over, you know, back to work. Um, but anyway, it was a good, um, reading week. My mom and I did lots of reading at the beach and at the pool and it was great to just sit for a couple of hours and read. <laughs> so let's hop into it and I'll tell you what I actually read. Okay. Amazing. Five star. Like I can't go on enough about how amazing The Lonely Passion of Judith Hearn by Brian Moore was book fantastic it'll absolutely be one of those books that I remember for a long time Brian Moore is an Irish author um, and this was his debut published in 1955 um, Judith Hearn is and the story takes place in the 50s um, so Judith Hearn is in her 40s she is this spinster who sort of grew up in sort of this genteel upbringing, but she's now quite poor. And in fact, she's so poor that if she goes out for tea, like she doesn't leave a tip because she can't really afford to. But yet she wants to maintain the pretense of respectability. So the book opens with her moving into a bedsit um, in an area of Belfast that was, you know, previously also kind of well-to-do, but has now fallen on harder times. Um, and she uh, meets the landlady's brother, Mr. Madden, um, and he has returned from living in America. Um, and so initially the beginning of the book is the two of them having completely incorrect assumptions about one another. He sort of assumes she has money and she's under the impression that he was a New York hotelier um, you know, he dresses nicely, so she sort of assumes he has money and is respectable. Um, and so the two of them go to the movies together, go to dinner, and she sort of assumes he wants to marry her, but he's interested in opening a business and wants her to invest. So the two of them have completely different ideas about what's going on here. Um, and about halfway through the book, the two of them sort of realize she's not very wealthy, neither is he. He was a doorman in New York. And so that point on um, starts a chain of events for Judith. She descends back into alcoholism and she has just this series of humiliations, one after the other. I will not give away the ending of this book, which was perfect and like gut-wrenching. Like, and I was reading along and I'd keep going like, oh my God, oh my God. 
And my mother was like, what? <laughs> um, it, anyway, amazing, amazing book. Um, yeah, I just, I don't, I, I don't want to give away how it ends, but it's amazing and people need to read this book. And in fact, this book prompted me to get some other Brian Moore books and prompted my mom to buy a Brian Moore book. Um, and I have that uh, included in my February, my book haul video that, that just went up. Um, so that was kind of how things started off. Um, amazing. And then um, at the same time, I was listening to Liliana's Invisible Summer by Christina Rivera Garza. And this is Garza's memoir about the murder of her sister 30 years ago by an ex-boyfriend in Mexico. Um, so this is kind of about um, her journey to sort of reconstruct her sister's life and what happened. I DNF'd this book and I feel really, really guilty about that. Like, like I'm somehow minimizing Garza's grief or minimizing Liliana's life. Um, I've spent a bit of time thinking about why didn't this work for me? It is a grief memoir. And so I'm not sure, you know, I'm not a big memoir reader. So the, so memoirs are new territory for me. So I don't know if it was being a grief memoir that I didn't really like. Um, a lot of the book is her reading Liliana's journal entries and letters to her friends. And I think the intent is to, is to try and give the reader a sense of what Liliana was like as a person so that you could share in Garza's grief as well and sort of appreciate what her family and her community lost with her death. Me, I just found it like it was too much. Like I only, I don't need to listen to a lot of letters going back and forth between 16 year old girls. Um, I don't know, I found a lot of that content uninteresting. I also listened to this on audiobook and, and I don't know if sort of listening to letters being read and journal entries, if that would have been better in a physical book form. I don't know, the, her, I just found myself not compelled to, to keep listening. Um, so I don't know, take, take my thoughts with the, with a grain of salt. There's, there's nothing wrong with Garza's writing. Um, and in fact, I have another one of her books on my TBR to read. So I definitely don't hesitate to pick something else up of hers. Again, I'm, I'm just not sure this was the book for me. Um, and then I picked up A Foot in Eden by Ron Rash. And again, this is another one of the books that is in my book haul video. Um, Ron Rash, this is his 2002 debut. And Ron Rash lives in the Western Carolinas. He's probably one of the most well-known Appalachian writers. And... I just felt like, like I needed to read one of his books, finally. Um, so A Foot in Eden opens with the murder of um, a fairly unlikable um, Korean War veteran um, in this small, um, you know, North Carolina mountain town. Um, and it's told in five parts. The first part is the sheriff investigating this murder. The second part is, um, and, and it's very clear in that first part that um, the neighbor, 
<laughs> uh, Billy, the farmer next door, is, is the person who killed this man. So the second part is told from Amy's perspective, Billy's wife. The third part is Billy's perspective. The fourth part is Isaac, their son's perspective. And the very last part is Bobby, the deputy. This Ron Rash up to this point, I think was known as a poet and he had several published poetry collections. And you know, you can tell from his writing, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, this, this story, it, it just is very well crafted, very propulsive. So in each section, obviously, as you get a new person's perspective, you, you know, the, the bigger story, it starts to, to come out. Um, this, although there's a murder, this is not a mystery. Um, it's very clear, like, what happened. Um, so in case you're looking at this as, oh, it's a mystery. It's not a mystery. <laughs> um, and a lot of it is how that murder sort of reverberates in the community and through this family. There's a bit of sort of the sins of the father um, being visited upon the children. Um, Ron Rash is clearly interested in the loss of Appalachian language and culture. Um, these events are being told against the backdrop of Carolina Power coming in and building a dam. And when the dam is completed, this entire valley where this community lives will be destroyed. Um, and so that loss of, of Appalachian culture is definitely on, on Ron Rash's mind. And I suspect that's probably a theme that carries through a lot of his writing. Um, there's a lot of biblical imagery in this book as well. You obviously, you've got a flood. Uh, there's, um, scenes with sort of crown of thorns. There's, there's son Isaac, <laughs> um, you know, again, there's a lot with sin. Um, so anyway, I absolutely loved this book and I will absolutely pick up more of Ron Rash's books in, in the future. Um, then I picked up Richard Yates's Disturbing the Peace. This was also part of that book haul. Um, as I mentioned in that video, I had read Revolutionary Road several years ago, which is Richard Yates's probably his most famous book. And I thought that book was really good. And so I wanted to pick up something else. This was published in 1975. And this is like the white male unraveling book. <laughs> um, John Wilder is our main character and he is a married alcoholic father. He works as an advertising salesman and he's a total philanderer and he's he's he you know I think he's supposed to be sort of an everyman but he's definitely kind of a jerk um and really this book is charting his descent into mental illness and it it sort of ends with his complete break with reality. It is, someone in Goodreads described it as Mad Men meets One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and I think that's a really a good description. I mean, there's a lot with his drinking and philandering, um, and then he, he spends, he has a stint in Bellevue, uh, the mental health hospital in um, New York City. And then he later, he ends up in California and he, he ends up in um, mental health facilities in, in LA. Um, but this, it's absorbing, it's disturbing. There's a very matter of fact writing style here um, that 
it doesn't pass judgment on Wilder's behavior, which is kind of interesting. I mean, again, he's a jerk. He's a terrible father, terrible husband. You know, when he is drunk, he, it, you know, it just like his sexist, racist comments come out. Um, and then, you know, as you keep going along and how it ends, you're sort of actually left wondering, you know, was that behavior just part of his descent into mental illness and his break with reality? Like, is he that much of a jerk or are these just symptoms of his, his disease? Um, so, you know, it's an, it's an interesting book about mental illness written 50 years ago. Um, it's, it's pretty spare and unflinching. And I, you know, again, I, I really liked it. Um, and so again, I, I, th I will read more of Richard Yates. Thought this was great. Then I read on the plane on the way home, um, a book, um, Stones from a Landslide, um, a novella by Maria Barbell. And this is a, uh, novella that's, that's, um, translated from the Catalan by Laura McLaughlin and Paul Mitchell. Um, interesting tidbit. This is the second book ever published by Pyrene Press. Um, but this is the, the, tells the story of Concha, I, I believe is how it's pronounced, from when she was 13 to when she's sort of an elderly woman. Um, she comes from a very poor farming family in the Pyrenees and um, I think she's one of six children and because her family really can't afford to care for six children, she is sent into another town uh, to live with her aunt and uncle who are childless and help her aunt on their farm. And it's, it's a lot about her feeling sort of rootless as a child and then it, it turns into she, you know, meets um, a young man and it's their falling in love and getting married and having children. Um, and then the Spanish Civil War occurs. So it's what happens to her and her family during the war and then a sort of the, the fallout after. Um, and you know it's it and it ends with her living with her son and his wife in Barcelona so it's it's her life and how it dramatically changes over these years as sort of a reflection of how Spain itself has changed uh, over you know since the early I think it starts in like 1921 um, you know uh, into the 50s or the 60s. So, so again, it's it's how Spain has changed. Um, it's a lot about the fall of agrarian culture in the Pyrenees. Um, I, I think what's most compelling is is Concha's just her narrative voice and her. You know, it's very simple prose um but it's it you know her sort of spirit and her you know rolling with it and keeping on going through all of this change and adversity um it's it's really her voice that that sort of keeps you going and keeps keeps you interested in this book um you know she works hard loves her family and you know is is you know it's you know how to you know how are you having fulfillment in your life um 
So, you know, simple story, but great. Um, and, and again, a lot. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll just start repeating myself. <laughs> Um, so definitely a great novella and something to keep in mind for those who want to participate in Shorty September. Um, that was sort of what I finished. Um, I've got a number of things on the go. I started Beadworkers, um, from Beth Piatote. This is part of my Pacific Northwest Indigenous reading project that I'm doing with Melinda at Web of Stories. So this is our February read. Um, oddly, before I left for Florida, I picked up Cat Brushing by Jane Campbell. This is also a collection of short stories. So for someone to who doesn't really do short stories very well. It's a little strange that I'm reading two collections. But um, anyway, I'm actually really liking this. Uh, so hang on, I will say more about it later. And I picked up and started American Precariat um, last night. This is a collection of essays um, Um, from incarcerated writers. And so um, there's an essay and then in between the essays are conversations between some of the editors about the essay. So I read the forward and the intro. I think there's a forward in it. Yeah, read the forward and the intro last night and I think this is gonna be amazing. So really excited. Um, and I also started listening on audio to push out the criminalization of African American girls in school by Bonique W. Morris. Um, I am not very far into it, but I think that book is going to make me both angry and nauseous. <laughs> so, um, really looking forward to getting more into that one. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So thank you so much for watching and hope you all are having a good week and uh, talk to you next week.